Hello everyone, Florence Theriault here. I'm here to share with you some absolutely beautiful dolls. I'm really excited about them. Uh, this is a one owner auction that we're going to have. It's from the collection of Sandy Kralowitz of Houston, Texas, previously of Scottsdale, Arizona, where many collectors knew her from. Had been a doll collector and dealer for decades and decades and decades and had a true appreciation for beautiful dolls. And the entire auction, there'll be over 500 lots in that auction, will be entirely dedicated to her collection. So when I show you some dolls today, you have got to realize we're speaking of a fraction of what there is. One of the things that Sandy loved, we named the collection Dreams because to Sandy, that's what doll collecting was all about. It was a dream. If you could imagine, if you could dream something, her family sent me the story of her own life story. Sandy didn't come from wealth. It was hard scrabble all the way with she and her husband, Richard, and when they started their, their uh, married life together and they built up a business and then she, she expanded into her love of antiques and was able to do this. And I tell you all this because so many of you say, I don't have a chance with dolls. I don't have the money that a lot of these other people have. What am I going to do? Well, here's one of this collection you're going to see came from a woman who came from that same kind of background. She didn't have a lot of funds, but she, she grew and she grew. She would buy, she would sell, she would upgrade. And that's what you can do. And when you see this collection, the catalog is over 250 pages and it just doesn't stop. Believe me, I know, I did it, I'm tired. So let me share with you a few of the dolls that you will see in the catalog, you will see here. And hopefully if you will come to our first um, traveling West again auction since the COVID shutdown, we will be in Scottsdale, Arizona the first weekend in January, um, which was Sandy's hometown where she began her business and began her collecting. We'll hope to see you all there to see hundreds more of these wonderful dolls. Well, one of Sandy's favorites was what I refer to as the little ones. And we did a, had a photograph of Sandy, which was a fabulous photograph. Sandy standing in her backyard with this, you know, Sandy was a tall woman and standing next to this statue that was as tall as Sandy was of a doll. She had acquired that from Mildred Seeley years ago and they had it in her yard. And I loved seeing that because that was Sandy next to this big statue. And then you walk in her house and you see these little ones. And it's such a contradiction, but that's what Sandy was. She loved them all. She loved all things doll, all things childhood, a great sense of fun and whimsy. So here we go. Now, what are the story of the little ones? Of course, little dolls have always been around, whether whatever a, a doll child could carry with them, made out of any kind of material. But the, the story of the little ones, as they refer to in Bisque, really began in the 1870s and then into the um, early 1880s. In 1878, a French doll shop, um, La Poupe de Nuremberg, um, with Madame Lavallee Perrone, introduced dolls that she called poupées de poche, which is a literal trans literally translates into English as dolls of the pocket. A doll that you could was so small that a child could tuck it in their pocket, take it with them anywhere. And I always like to jokingly say to doll collectors today, these are great ones to buy another one and carry them home because the person you live with might not even know you brought another one home, they're so little. But at any rate, she introduced um, her concept of poupées de poche. And in the meantime, she introduced them with in a whole variety of styles. And I'm gonna show you different varieties of what we have here. In the meantime, the Paris department stores had also been advertising them. And they were in their Christmas catalogs, the Atrends catalogs at um, the beginning of each holiday season. And they were done in a variety of styles and types and presentation trunks with extra costumes. So let's look at some. And while I'm, I'll be showing them to you and I'll just keep talking along. Um, the dolls were offered in a variety of ways. They could have bare feet, for example. And one of the desirable things that collectors always look for I'm going to turn this around, take advantage of having this, are these wonderful mohair wigs with the long braids that go down really to below their little butt, um, to find them in original costumes. And then they came with open mouth or with closed mouth. Swivel heads were always desirable, and those heads were perfectly fitted into little um, kid lining the top of their neck torso so that they could turn back and forth and swivel around without hurting the doll. 
Um, they come with different types of eyes. They might have sleep eyes. They might have um, set-in eyes. They could be brown. They could be blue. And then there were all of the things that collectors look for, which is, again, another barefoot example. We have here an example with little peach, painted peach boots, which would be a rare variation of the boots. And this doll, when I set her down, I want you to notice because she is wearing the kind of original costumes that these dolls were presented in. They were really quite simple. They might have a little chemise underneath, and then it would be just a little muslin princess-style dress with a little um, ribbon and lace trim on them. Very, very simple. And then variations that collectors always want to look for, and you'll find several of these in Sandy's collection, is the little girl, the rare little girl with the jointed um, elbows. So very, very rare examples. And there were some that were simply joined, and then there were others that had a wooden ball joint, and these were um, patented by a Ferdinand Sustrak in the, um, 18, about 1877. Now, um, Madame Lavallee Perone uh, in A La Poupée de Nuremberg Doll Shop, um, she published the magazine La Poupée Modèle, which many of you are familiar with from later years. La Poupée Modèle also introduced Lily the Fashion Doll, which by the way there is one in this collection. And Lily the Fashion Doll was a standard size fashion doll comparable to, I'm going to say the word, Barbie in the um, 1960, early 1960s. The concept being that the doll shop would sell a doll, but then guess what else was going to happen? The parent was going to come back and buy costumes and shoes and accessories and all of the ephemera pieces that would keep that doll and the little child satisfied. So uh, Madame, Madame uh, Lavelle Perron had her Lily fashion doll, but then she saw there was, was another possibility. Let's do these little ones. She tried calling them. Um, the Poupée de Poche, and that name, it just didn't click with people. So a couple of years later, she introduced them and she said, now I'm known as Mademoiselle Mignonette. And Mignonette, that clicked. And that's what the dolls became known as, and that's what we call them to this day, the Mignonettes. So I've shown, shown you some of the French ones. Now I'm just going to show you a variety of the other kind of Mignonettes that were produced in France and Germany over the next say 15 years. And I guess I'm just going to pick them up as I have them here. I don't have them in any special kind of order because they're all just so wonderful. Oh my God, here's one of my favorites. Look at this. I love these. These are so rare. And I'm going to show you a couple other examples. Look at that. She's leaning against the chair. And why is she doing that? She's able to because this doll has these wonderful little jointed knees. All right, they're, and they're just, they're not only jointed, but they're bent in such a way and made in such a wonderful way that you can articulate the doll in so many different poses. And here is her sister. And her sister also has these little jointed knees. There you can see them. And notice something else, for example. You're a child, you're going to the store. Well, which one do you want? Blue shoes or gray shoes? because the store would go out of their way to make different type of things possible. So you could choose the one you want, or actually, as a parent, you might choose both and take both home. So the jointed knee was a very, very rare extra luxury example, and there are several of those to be shown here. Two companies, well, one company in particular, uh, made the dolls for the French market that were made in Germany, but marketed as French. And that's a dilemma for collectors today. What do we call them? I know this personally, because when I'm cataloging, every time I have one, I say, what do I call it now in the header? Do I call it French? Do I call it for the French market? Do I call it German? And it's a constantly ongoing decision. You have to decide what you call them. But you do have to realize that many of the dolls that were sold as little French mignonettes were actually made in Germany and then came to France and acquired a, a marketplace in France, a store that would sell them, a store that would costume them, would present them in little mignonettes. Look at this little wonderful doll. This was made by Simon and Halbig. Look at her beautiful little bisque hands. 
those bare bisque feet. She is not all bisque. She has a muslin body. So very, very different variation still could fall in the category of the little mignonettes. Wonderful face on her. I had a seminar, I gave a seminar about 20 years ago. And at that point, all I thought about were the bodies. And I always thought that the dolls should always be shown naked so you could see the different variations in bodies. And I asked the people who were there, well, what do you look for in an all bisque doll? Do you want them costumed or nude? Costumed, costumed, we all want them costumed, which kind of surprised me. But then I also asked them, well, what is the category you most look for in an all bisque doll? The face, they always look for the face. The, even in these tiny little dolls, and then I started paying attention to it when I was cataloging them, which of the dolls had these wonderful, just, they're just so tiny, and the detailing and the painting on them is so exquisite. Here's a wonderful doll, and we're showing her with her skirt kind of lifted a little because we wanted you to see her legs. And look at she has these, the dolls, the collectors call these dolls the French wrestler, which I think is a perfectly awful name. But so be it, if you've seen a poster of a kind of a French wrestler of the time, that's what they look like, these really, really muscular. And then they always have these tiny little ankles and tiny little feet. And that's exactly what this doll has. Very, very beautiful example of an of a all bisque. Here's one, if you want to see a little more of what their bodies look like, you can see it in this girl. You can see it a little better. All right. This is why the ones that have the jointed knees are so desirable to collectors. Well, not only are they rare, and I'm sure at the time were extremely expensive, but you can articulate them in so many different ways that you can't when they're just the five-part body. But again, here are the muscular legs and those tiny little feet and ankles. Very, very pretty. And if you notice the bed she's sitting on, there's a, just a grand abundance of this, not dollhouse furniture, but furniture styled for small dolls in like the 10 inch size. Let me see who else I want to show you. I want to show you this girl. And what do you, what do you notice rare about this? As you start collecting these and you more and more look at them, you, um, you start to notice features that are different. And of course, the first thing that should have come to your mind when you saw this doll was her size. So when you can find them in the more than six or seven inches, if they get up into the eight, the nine, the 10 inch size of all bisque, this is a very, very rare size. And certainly not only would have been more luxurious and expensive to buy at the time for the parent, but really difficult to preserve over all of these years. So that's a very lovely example. Here's another one of the little barefoot kids. And again, I want you to see her legs, how she has been doing her workouts. Okay. I, this is an unusual doll. Again, not at all bisque. I want to point that out to you. A very, very rare body because she is, she has a kid got body with gusset jointing and almost like a standard German uh, bisque doll, uh, a larger child doll. So she has the a gusset jointed bisque, but she has bisque arms and she has that same little uh, bisque head that you see on the all bisque. So it's a kind of a variation, a cross between a kid body child and the all bisque child. Very rare example. Now, come over to the other side. You can go down here, dear. Two large girls. And I wanted you to see them because, again, they're beautifully costumed. And they are, um, she is with little painted teeth. And she is with an open mouth. And the square cut teeth on the top and the one square cut, square cut tooth on the bottom. So different variations in the way their mouth is, is um, presented giving um, different changes. But look at the rest of them, the modeled bent right arm with a really impressed, look at the elbows of the arms, how such detail on these tiny dolls, the impressed dimples at the elbow. I mean, this is just wonderful, wonderful workmanship. And then check out their legs. And I'm gonna tip them back, make sure the camera can get their stockings. Is that good? 
All right, I'm going to leave them down. I, that would probably be a better way. So one of them has yellow boots and white stockings, and one of them has black high-laced ankle boots and blue stockings. These kind of different variations allow the manufacturer to be, um, to be assuming to be offering a wide variety in his line, but could basically be the same doll. So here we have kind of like the same body style, variations in the mouth, variations in the stockings, and you, voila, you have different choices for a child to choose. Or again, with a lucky parent, you might get more than one. When um, La Poupe Model first introduced their wonderful doll, they also introduced it in presentation cases as well. And many of the department stores followed up on this so that over the years, excuse me, her little wig is not glued down. She's losing her wig. Uh, many of the stores continued to offer these over the years in a fitted box with one, two, three, four, four additional original costumes and a beautiful little early, this would be from the 1878 to 1880 period, one of the early first mignonettes in her original um, gift presentation box. Very desirable. This is another of the little German dolls, the German all bisque again with her this very standardized kind of bent elbow here with the dimples on it and again wonderful, this again a different variety painted yellow boots. I talked to a collector a bit ago who I know has been collecting these for many, many years. And I said, well, do you have everything? And she said, no, Florence, I haven't been able to find one with gray boots. That's my dream. I've got to find that. And I was so excited when I got this collection. I said, okay, we're going to have this for her here, but no gray boots. I'm sorry. Just about every other color, but not the gray. So again, just a great variety. So much fun to have all of these different styles. The hair was made in this kind of very, very typical way where it has the, um, the ribbon, the band around the top of the head, allowing it to have little bangs coming down. And then where the ridge, the seam would have been, they would always have put the ribbon there. So those are wonderful original wigs. This one's one of my favorites. Very, very um, classic Simon and Halbig face, but I love everything about her, ranging from her um, costume to her complete presentation. Beautiful. And look at her unusual white stockings. Again, you kind of, as you see more and more of these, you immediately will spot something that ha is an original, not original, but unusual variation of a stocking or a shoe. And that would be the case with this little girl. And what else about her do we notice? Size. She's a tall girl. So, and you're a collector, you see all these great points. Rarity, tall, swivel head, rare boots, beautiful costume. But there's one other thing you want, and this girl has it. What is it? It's a beautiful face. So this doll is just a winner in every way, Simon and Halbig. And we have another wonderful little Simon and Halbig girl. And again, check out the boots, a different variation. And beautiful, beautiful face with those wide, brilliant eyes, swivel head, and different um, thing. And she's, she now has more of like the classic Simon and Halbig arms, which are straighter. Uh, the other ones, those little bent wood that I showed you, were more of the, of the Kessner or Altbeck and Gosschalk or Kling manufacturers tended to do those. One of the problems you're going to have when you collect these, if you are a person who feels an obligation to have to identify every doll specifically as to maker, you will run into problems like this. As I said, many of them were made by German firms for the French market, so you might not find markings on them. The best we can do is try to identify um, stylistic decoration on them, stylistic modeling things that can help us identify it. But um, you may also decide just to satisfy yourself with the phrase German made for the French market or for the French market or French style. This is a decision you have to make in identifying them, knowing that um, the French were, they were going wild in the 1880s. Their Bebe market had just taken, taken root and they were running with it. They had to make, they had to meet all of these demands for 
the popular Bebe doll that they were trying to supply to all of the stores. And the little mignonettes, they were great, but there wasn't a big profit picture for them there. So if they could sell them, they would like to do it, but they were going to have somebody else make them. And let's make a phone call. Well, not a phone call. Let's set somebody off on a cart and donkey and head out to Germany and let's pick some up from there, bring them home to us, put the wigs on, put the costumes on, put them in our French packaging, and let's call them French. And that's mainly what happened most of the time. Now let me see, who else didn't I show you here? I Look at her face. This is a different face. Very, very different. Do not assume they're all going to look alike. You have to look at them. Again, they're tiny. They're just like the size of a quarter at most, some of them the size of a nickel. And to think that they could make that with the quality of bisque and the painting, that very, very delicate painting that had to be done on it. This was, uh, this was artistry. It really was, folks. Don't, don't ever let anyone tell you differently. And again, she has very, very fancy boots. Not only does she have the silk laces, but if you were looking at her closely, you'd see that right at the tip of her shoe, she has little bows, not only painted, but little model bows on them. And again, a beautiful, beautiful costume all the way around and those long blonde braids cascading all the way down her back. Stand up straight here now. Very nice, She's a beautiful doll. Seeing the color of the eyes is one of the ways to help date them because these cobalt eyes really were made at the latest into the late 1870s, early, early 1880s. So when you see those eyes, that's a clue of an earlier doll. And then I think I haven't shown you this beautiful little girl. Oh, I love her. Look at now, she has closed mouth. She has the same kind of boots with a little bow on the front, right? And she has a smug little face. I find myself wanting to use the word pert over and over when I was cataloging these dolls and I finally went to a thesaurus to see what other word I could use and there wasn't much else that kind of fit the definition, maybe sprightly, but calm and gentle also helped to find the demeanor on the, face, on the faces of many, many of these dolls. And then I think one more down here that I haven't shown you because once again, okay, now look, you think this is not a pert little face? Check that out. That is one pert face. Very, very sweet. You, you would choose this doll for its face if you hadn't already said, wow, those are pretty nice. Those are brown. Those aren't the black painted lace uh, boots. These are the brown ones with the little bow in the front. And she has really beautiful, folks, brown eyes, which you don't find very often, brown eyed on them. So all of these features you kind of learn to pick up when you spot something differently. You'll spot it right off the bat and you'll say, oh, that'll be a different one to have in my collection. And I wanted to just point out to you because everyone's always looking for accessories for their all bisque, that there are like six or eight of these wonderful Merklin carriages that are getting harder and harder to find that will appear in the auction. And so they're great. See, when you see her next to it, isn't that wonderful? It just changes everything. It pops it off to life. So let's see some of the other things that might be in this collection.